I'll give a quick summary of what RIS-5 is and hopefully set the context for the other talks. Um, we also have a lot of talks from outside um, this time, which is going to be good. Anyway, let's dive in. Um, okay, so we're all here because instruction sets don't really matter. Um, and you know, the reason they don't matter is that when you actually look at a system when it's running, uh, most of the performance and energy is due to other things like algorithms, application code, the quality of your compiler, the operating system, the runtimes. There is a small impact from the ISA you choose, um, but then there's other things like the microarchitecture, the core, the memory hierarchy, uh, how good you are at doing circuit design, uh, physical design, the floor planning of the chip, and then fabrication process is a big factor also, right? So all these other factors are big influences on how well a uh, processor performs, but this is only the processor. When you look at a system, there's all these other things like the displays, radios, DC DC converters, uh, those all take power too, right? So. You know, the ISA in some sense doesn't really matter. The, the reason you realize that maybe it does matter is when you try and change it. Um, so ISAs do matter because um, this is the most important interface in a computer system, right? So this is where hardware beats software. Um, and what you'll find if you try and change the ISA, there's a big cost to actually port and tune all the ISA dependent parts of a modern software stack, right? There's a large number of pieces there. You know, things like the compiler operating system. Um, what you may not be aware of if you haven't done this is the large cost to um, port and recompile all the things that were supposed to be ISA independent but actually are not. And some of the reasons are there are quirks uh, in languages, there's also bugs, and so you're actually compatible with the bugs in the old ISA's toolchain, for example. Um, so there's a large cost there. Another thing is this all assumes you have the code, and if you're using off-the-shelf closed source, then you may not have um, the code available. Um, and even if it is your own code, you may have forgotten how to recompile it, which is pretty common as well. Your uh, tool chain got a bit rot, or you just lost your own source code. This kind of happens pretty frequently also in companies. Um, anyway, and th this is kind of a worry because most of the cost of developing a new chip is developing all the software for it. Okay? And um, what's worse is if you look at modern chips, uh, most of the current SOCs have uh, multiple different ISAs on the chip. You know, 15 to 20 is not unheard of, different ISAs on a single chip these days. Um, so, if the choice of the ISA doesn't have much impact on energy and performance, right, um, and it costs a lot to use different ones, why isn't there just a free open standard ISA that we can use for everything, right? That's basically the premise uh, behind RISC-V. Um, um, and open, what's surprising, if you look at the rest of the industry, there's all these open uh, standards everywhere else in the industry. You know, everything from networking, operating systems, you know, compilers, databases, graphics. There's an open standard, and those open standards have um, open source implementations, but also proprietary implementations of the same standard, right? So you could run POSIX applications on top of Windows, right? So the important thing is these open standards, and if you look at the one place where there isn't one, it's at the architecture level, where hardware meets software. There's no open standard there for which you can have multiple um, competing vendors providing implementations, right? All we have are the proprietary ISAs that are locked down. Um, so I say should be free and open is our position. Um, and if you look at why, why are we at this point, why is it that there are no uh, free and open ISAs? Well, it's not for any technical reason, it's just historical and business reasons, right? So this is not um, an error of omission by the owners of the ISAs. It's not like, you know, Intel and ARM just forgot to make their ISA open. They very aggressively pursue anybody who tries to use their ISAs without licensing it from them. Um, and it's not because these guys actually do all the software development for those ISAs. Like, you know, license the ISA from us and we'll write all your code for you. That's not the way it works either, right? Most of the software is written by other people, the vast majority of it. Um, and it's not like they're good at doing it either, right? So the current ISAs are pretty poor. Like, they're, they're just, actually, the more you look at it, you just, they're just terrible. Like, there's no good reason for them being the way they are. Even ones that have been redesigned recently, right, are just terrible. So it's not like these companies are good at doing it either, right? Um, and it's not like the old legacy ones they have, they're great stewards of these ISAs. If it wasn't for AMD, your 64-bit Intel chips would be titaniums, right? Just think of what they try to do to the industry. Billions of dollars were lost in companies uh, trying to you know, go with titanium until, you know. So these guys are not very good at looking after an ISA either. They make big mistakes, uh, lose companies huge amounts of money. Um, it's not as if you need a company to verify ISA compatibility. Like, we're very good in the industry. We've got many, many other kinds of open standards. We've all figured out how to verify interoperability and compliance. Uh, there's things that are much harder than an ISA, things like radio standards, like Wi-Fi, LTE. Those are much more difficult to verify interoperability. And we can do that as industry, right? So there's no reason that ISA is something special about that we need a company to verify compatibility. 
Um, and it's not as if buying an ISA from somebody protects you from a patent lawsuit either. So, you know, currently NVIDIA is suing um, Qualcomm and Samsung because they're using um, IP that came from ARM and Imagination Technologies, right? So NVIDIA believes that, you know, the um, Imagination and uh, ARM GPU IP violates some of their patents, so they don't go after ARM and Imagination, they go after customers of ARM Imagination, right? So just buying it from somebody doesn't protect you from these lawsuits either. Um, and what's other thing is if you build your whole world around a proprietary ISA, there's no guarantee it will last. So, you know, the, it's tied to the business fortunes of the company that owns the ISA. So if you, you know, remember, there used to be this somewhat significant computer company called Digital Equipment Corporation that had some very popular ISAs, VAX, and then Alpha. And they've both gone now because of, you know, various business decisions at uh, that company. Right. And, you know, who knows how long x86 and ARM will survive, you know, so... Who knows when that'll be? So if you're thinking 50-year time frames, uh, and some of the software we are now embedding in systems may need to be maintained 50 years out, um, will those companies still be around? Okay, so RISC-V. Um, so back uh, in 2010, the history here is that uh, we were, you know, in our groups, we build, do a lot of research, we do a lot of um, experiments with simulators and building chips, and every so often we go revisit what kind of ISA should we be using for the next batch of projects. And back then, the obvious choices were x86 and ARM, because those are the most dominant ISAs, and they still are today. Um, but if you look at x86, it's just impossible, right? This is a hugely complex ISA, um, you know, thousand, over a thousand instructions, and growing, you know, a new instruction every couple of weeks, literally. Um, and the ISA manual is, you know, many thousand pages. Um, very complicated semantics. So this is just too complicated to even contemplate building anything around. And there's also all these IP issues. Intel would not let you actually distribute RTL for an x86 compatible core, right? It just wouldn't allow you to do that. We looked at ARM. It seemed it should be somewhat simpler. It was a risk design. The R in ARM does stand for risk. Um, but that just seemed to be mostly impossible. Um, so ARM v7, at the time we're doing this, v8 hadn't been released. v7 is very complicated and baroque. There's, I don't know what they were thinking. Um, and there's also even, in some ways, even worse IP issues around the ARM uh, ecosystem. Okay, um, so the ARM v7 manual itself is like 2,700 pages. Um, so that's a, the big barrier to entry, 400 instructions, right? Um, so we decided back in uh, summer 2010, um, sort of May-June time frame, to go off and do our own uh, new ISA, Clean Slate ISA. Um, we thought this would be a three-month project. That was, uh, you know, let's do this over the summer. Um, you know, four years later, um, we actually released the frozen uh, spec. That was at, uh, just before hot chips last year. Um, that's where we started the big push to take this out. Um, so it wasn't like we just sat in a room, though, for four years working on the specification. We actually implemented it multiple times, built compilers for it, tried to map operating systems. We actually worked on it over the course of those four years, many iterations. Um, so we felt it was pretty solid at the time we decided to freeze that uh, base specification. Um, OK, so what is RISC-V? Um, so to be clear, this is a new free and open ISA developed here at UC Berkeley. Um, and it's free as in beer and free as in speech, right? So it doesn't cost you anything to use it, and nobody's going to stop you using it. OK, that's the, that's the idea. Um, it's designed for research and education initially, but now we're hoping and it seems to be uptake in the commercial side also. Um, and another thing, you know, I want to attack some of the people who've been talking about this lately. It's not just the free ISA. We also think it's a good ISA, you know. It's not, um, uh, we actually think it's a good design, not just uh, something, because it's free, it's why people are using it. We actually think it's a good design. Okay, so what's different about RISC-V? Um, well, it's simple. So it's far simpler than the other commercial ISAs. Um, we, did this, we have the benefit of starting again. Um, so there's a clean slate design where we clearly separate the user level design from anything to do with the privilege levels or anything to do with the microarchitecture. Um, and we want to make this good at many different microarchitectural styles. We didn't design it to work with only one particular kind of microarchitecture flavor. Um, it's a modular ISA, so there's a very small standard base ISA that you can use as the basis of lots of different kinds of processor. Um, and on top of that, we add multiple different standard extensions uh, as well. But it's also designed not just for general purpose computing, but designed to be a base to do specialized engines. So in particular, there's a very large instruction encoding space. It's free and open to do things in. Uh, and furthermore, there's variable length instruction encoding, so you can actually support a vast opcode space for extensions. The other thing is we want this to be stable. And um, uh, by stable, I mean the base and these extensions we've currently defined are frozen. They're not going to change ever. That's it. There's not going to be a version 2.1, 2.2, 2.3 of this ISA. That's it. It's fixed. And that's an important feature of this versus other ISAs. Extension happens by adding a new module, a new extension, not by 
playing with the base uh, ISA and adding a new version number to it. And we think that's very important. In particular, the base integer ISA is something we think is viable. You can run C compilers, operating systems, you know, position independent code, linkers, everything that you need in the modern software stack on that simple base ISA. And we think that's going to be enough going you know, many years in the future. That's all you will need. And it's a great starting point if you want to then go do something else on, on top of that. One thing that people also get confused about, and I'll hammer this on a few times, RISC-V is not an open source processor. So it's, it's a little bit inaccurate to describe RISC-V as an open source project. The source here is, is really just a specification, right? So RISC-V itself is a free and open specification of how you should design hardware and how you should map your software to that hardware, right? So the important thing is you want to allow, in fact, encourage both closed source and open source implementations of this specification. Right, um, and the, the real thing here is it's not about the hardware. So a lot of open source hardware projects fixate on the hardware artifacts, but that's really the easy part. The hard part is all the software that has to run on it. So by having a stable base um, and then people put software to it, they want all that software to be there when you come and do your own hardware implementation. Right. Um, now that we've just been talking about the ISA, but in practice there's lots of other pieces of a system that also need to get specified. You know, things like I.O. and how things connect to other stuff. Um, we're sort of slowly working on expanding the set of things that we're nailing down in this free and open ecosystem to uh, include I.O. and accelerators. Um, so the base, uh, the, the part that's frozen is this uh, RISC-V base. Um, so we had these three base integer ISAs, RV32I, RV64I, and RV128I, corresponding to 32-bit, 64-bit, 128-bit uh, address space variants. Um, now the uh, RV128-bit was kind of a kind of a joke when we did the initial spec, but after talking to people, we realized that people are building solid state memory systems in data centers that are you know, multi-petabytes already, um, so many petabytes in a single cluster, which is more than 50 bits of addressable solid state storage. Um, and looking to the directions in data centers, we sort of see maybe sometime next decade, we'll need more than 64 bits to address the solid state memory in a data center cluster. Okay, so maybe 120 bits actually has a real use. You know, before I retire, people might be building 128-bit chips. Um, and the extreme other side of things, though, um, we came up with this RV32E recently. This is our fourth base integer ISA. And this is just a 16-register subset of RV32I. And we developed this as a preemptive strike against people wanting to fragment and do that anyway at the low-end microcontroller. And we'll talk more about this in the tiny uh, core session tomorrow, uh, talk tomorrow. Uh, but basically, if you're building a very, very tiny core, the registers are about half of the area of that core. And so cutting it back to 16 saves a lot at the very tiny end of things. Uh, we tried to like, quarantine how much effect this has on the whole universe by you know, sort of laying out when you would use RV32E versus just going to RV32I. Okay? So we added this uh, recently. But anyway, for these, all these base integer ISAs are very small, less than 50, depending on which one, less than 50 harder instructions are needed. Um, to implement the whole thing. And like I said, that's enough to run all the software. So the goal is in the future, compilers, operating systems, everything will work just with that base I subset. Right? That's enough to build a whole functioning computer that can run anything. Right? On top of that, we have the standard extensions, multiply divide, atomic memory operations, single precision, double precision, floating point. And that combination of I, M, A, F, D, we name the extensions by letters. Um, we call abbreviation is G. And that's meant to be a good general purpose ISA, like the general purpose software development, third party software development. That's the kind of ISA we expect people to use. There's also the quad precision floating point as an optional extension there that's also standardized. Um, so these are all frozen. These are things that are frozen. And they're just going to stay put and be supported forever after. Um, and this particular piece of the ISA space, if you build a machine that does this, it can just have a fixed 32-bit instruction format with a fixed naturally aligned 32-bit instruction word. Right? So that's very uh, straightforward to implement. So you actually look at the encoding. It's just a generic risk style encoding. Um, so it looks like a lot of the early risks. Um, so it's, we did it particularly simply to um, uh, you know, 32 integer registers. Um, one thing we did is make sure that RD, RS, the, the two sources and destination register are in fixed locations in the instruction and they don't move around. And also there's no implicit, um, there's no implicit registers in any instructions. So, you know, like for example, jump and link doesn't write to a special register, it writes to any register in the ISA. Um, immediate field is always sign extended from the same bit, that's important uh, for reducing circuitry and delay uh, through the system. If you add floating point, you add another 32 floating point registers plus a uh, condition register. 
um, and also another format to support Fuse MOLAD. So we do IEEE 2008 um, floating point. Yeah, so I said that this is enough to support all you need in a modern software stack. Now, one thing we did different from a classic RISC is we built in from the start the idea of variable length encoding. So the low two bits, because we have such a simple ISA, we can pack it into you know, a small piece of the encoding space. And the low two bits of the ISA encode uh, instruction length. So if it, the two bits are 1-1, it's a 32-bit instruction. If they're not 1-1, one, one, then it's a 16-bit uh, instruction. So we wanted to support compressed instructions from the get-go. Uh, but also, we added uh, space to expand the other way. So you can go to 48-bit, 64-bit, or longer instruction lengths in units of 16-bit parcels, right? So you can do variable length instructions, so arbitrary long uh, instructions. Now, the only cost we paid for this in the base ISA is that the branches and jumps target 16-bit boundaries and not 32-bit boundaries. So that means you give up one bit of range in the base ISA in exchange for giving you this flexibility. And we think that's a worthwhile trade. Um, so the compressed instruction set is something that we released since the last workshop. It's been out there for a while with all the tool chain. Um, and we believe this is important at both, at both ends of the spectrum. At the low end, the, the, the main interest is in reducing static code size. Um, and at the high end, in commercial workloads, the main interest is, is in reducing dynamic instruction footprint. So often a lot of the commercial servers have very, very large instruction binaries that uh, really um, uh, give a good workout to instruction cache hierarchy. So there's a, there's a uh, need there for more performance, basically, using the compressed code. So the standard extension we put out, um, Dave's going to give a talk on that tomorrow, uh, no, later today, and go over that in details. Um, so I won't spend much time on it here. But basically, we get about a 25 to 30% reduction in code size, bad these compressed instructions in. Um, and we have a lot of space left, actually, for future 16-bit extensions. We're uh, quite happy with how the encoding worked. So that's out there. Uh, it's working. Um, just to get back on this point of this is a simple ISA. Um, so let's do a comparison with v 8 which was also a clean slate design that came out after we started RISC-V. Um, and, you know, the, the metric I like the most, I guess, is, well, one thing is, one of the key things about RISC was number of addressing modes, right? So how do you address your operands? So if you, if you had a very simple categorization of RISC, is you know, register-rich load store architecture with very few ways of addressing operands, right? So in RISC-V, we have exactly one addressing mode, right? ARM V8 has eight, okay? Um, and if you look at the manual page for ARM V8, it's like five and a half thousand pages for the ARM V8 instruction. It's, it's huge, it's monstrous. Like there's everything in there you could imagine. Right, RIS-5 on the other hand is very small. So 33 times smaller manual, right? Um, and you know, the other guys have pretty big manuals too. MIPS is not too bad, you know, it's only you know, four or five times bigger than RIS-5, but um, you know, 8086 is another one. So the good thing about RISC-V is so simple, you can put the entire instruction set on one PowerPoint slide, somewhat legibly, right? So here's the RV32 base instructions. Um, this is our green card. Um, then you can add to that eight instructions to multiply divide, um, and, and 11 more if you want to add the atomic extensions. Um, the floating point, uh, single, double, and quad precision. Um, that's another bunch of instructions there. Uh, the compressed adds about 31. This might be slightly out of date with the current compressed set. And then for the wider ones, going to 64 bit, 128 bit, you just have a few more instructions to handle the different the new data types you get um, there. But um, basically, that's it, right? So that's you know actually three different instruction sets: 32 bit, 64 bit, 120 bit, with all the standard extensions on um, one sheet of paper, right? I think Mark Hill came up with this phrase that you know you know it's a risk because the manual doesn't need a staple, right? So. <laughs> Now, one thing going out to people talking about it is, um, you know, this, you know, simplicity breeds contempt, right? So you guys are just academics doing this tiny little thing. You know, it's a toy ISA. You know, real men have 10,000 page manuals, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, how can this simple ISA compete with these industry monsters, right? Well, actually, you know, everything we've been doing, you know, there's no evidence that it helps you at all. That big ISA is just, I don't know what they're, they're thinking. I think, you know, and going back to Cray and Risk and the other guys were right. You know, you don't need, if you go look at a code, it's all load store, add, jump. All the other stuff is just in the noise, right? Um, um, and there's a lot of advantages to keeping things simple. So, you know, teaching, what we do, professors do, um, is a lot easier if it's a simple ISA. Learning, you know, what engineers and students do, is a lot easier if it's simple to understand what's going on. Um, you know, in terms of area, energy, quality results versus design time, verification, security, extensibility, there's a lot of advantages to simplicity, right? 
And as far as we can tell, there's no real advantage to the uh, complexity of these industry monsters. Um, so um, uh, one of the things we have been doing is sort of filling out more of the space. Um, we have been looking at a, a proposed vector extension. I'll talk more about that later today. Um, and this is a Cray-style vector ISA, not a PAC SIMD or GPU-style ISA. I'll talk about that in the talk, why we're doing that. But the idea is to support you know, principal data parallel programming models, uh, auto-vectorization, implicit parallelism with OpenMP, as well as explicit parallelism with OpenCL. Uh, we're sort of working on this. We've done a, you know, I've spent half my life working on vectors, it turns out. Um, um, the privileged architecture released this also for comments over the last, uh, uh, in May, I guess. Um, we've worked on this for a long time. It came out finally. And we have the Unix ports and stuff up for that. So uh, we support uh, four privilege modes, user, supervisor, hypervisor, and machine, though you don't have to have all combinations. A simple embedded system can just use machine mode, or just machine and user, or something just using an OS can just support three of them. And if you want the full-blown virtualization stack, you add in hypervisor too. Um, we designed this to be very clean, to cleanly separate, those, separate out those layers. So Andrew will be giving a talk on that uh, later today. So the ecosystem, you know, it's kind of me filling out, building up, there's lots of stuff out there. Uh, documentation, the tools, uh, verification suites, hardware implementations. There's a good chance to give you a break now. I've been talking about RISC-V in general. And remember, we talked about RISC-V as a spec. It's not an open source project. I'm switching now to tell, talk a little about the open source cores that Berkeley have developed to that specification. Okay, so switching gears, all, there was the spec. Everybody should be using the spec and building their own stuff. This is our stuff that we've been building at Berkeley. Um, and the first thing to talk about is Chisel, which is a uh, new hardware description language within, with, that we use to write our RISC-V cores. Now, I know there's many of you out there who've been writing RISC-V cores in Verilog, VHDL, and BlueSpec, right? So it's not like you have to use Chisel to write a RISC-V core. It's just that that's what we use to write our RISC-V cores. We find it very productive. Um, so the Chisel efforts led by Jonathan Backrack, who's sitting over the back there. Um, so it's a very uh, powerful new hardware description language. It's embedded in the Scala um, language. And we just write um, a program in Scala enhanced with this Chisel library that generates a data structure that represents your design. And from that one description, we can generate bit accurate, cycle accurate C simulators, FPGA emulations, or uh, Verilog that we push through the standard tools to get layout. Um, one thing to say about Chisel, there's a 3.0 in development that should come out sometime soon, sort of months. Um, this is based around a new fertile intermediate representation, flexible intermediate representation for RTL. And the idea here is to support different language front ends and new target back ends, as well as transformations on that internal representation. And we're trying to make Chisel kind of become the LLVM for hardware, uh, is kind of the idea with this tool flow. So Chisel itself is interesting, but like I said, it's not the required piece of using RISC-V, it's just what we use to develop our course. And you'll see some of the benefits of using Chisel in the talks uh, later in the workshop. So the Berkeley RISC-V course, there's kind of two two kinds, there's the educational cores we use in classes, and these live in a repo we call Sodor. So any of you that use with kids who like trains know that that's the island that Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends lives on. Um, so we tend to name our processors after uh, trains. Um, after our very, very first design, we nicknamed Trainwreck. So everything after that was actually named after a locomotive. Um, um, so Rocket Chip, which is named after George Stevenson's rocket, um, is our chisel-based generator world. Uh, in which we develop all the production cores that are meant to be used you know, seriously for uh, an actual design. And then in the Chisel rocket chip includes cores on core and interconnect. And you'll see a bit more about that in the, the talk tomorrow morning uh, from Yonsa up on the uh, Z-scale. Um, so just to go over Sodor, it's a bunch of simple cores, uh, one stage, two stage, five stage pipelines, um, and also a bus-based microcode machine that people can learn microcode from. And what's nice about embedded you doing this in Scala, we actually can write the microcode compiler in Scala as well in Chisel and have it automatically build the microcode ROM at the same time um, that you have to design there. Um, so yeah, students can actually learn how to do microcode. So the, the production one, the rocket chip generator, we released this initially back in uh, last October, um, and the main processor there is the rocket core, which is a single issue in order, sort of classic five-stage pipeline, but it's, not, it's meant to be a production quality core, so it actually has things like um, you know, floating point units, um, MMUs, uh, kind of a heavyweight cache, a non-blocking data cache, and that's to work with accelerators and vector units. Uh, extensive branch prediction, co interface. It's kind of similar to an ARM A5, roughly. And the whole rocket chip generator, uh, written in Chisel, only takes about 12,000 lines of code for everything. And that includes the cores, the uncores, the interconnects, the FPUs, and MMUs, and everything. And this is a generator, not just a single uh, design instance. Uh, so, like I said, Yonsop will say, say more about Rocketship uh, tomorrow. 
the updates to that. So getting back to you know, industry, you know, people saying, well, this is a toy. Um, so we actually quickly for Hotchips did this comparison. You'll see some more in the talks tomorrow. Um, but this is for our rocket in order core. We tried to configure it up to look like the numbers that Armut put out for the Core X85. Um, and you know, the caveat here is this is not an apples to apples comparison. We don't know exactly what's in um, the Cortex A5. For example, it does include the Core Side debug, but it doesn't include the, the floating point and it doesn't include Neon. Uh, it does have the sort of ARMv7 SIMD instructions in there. Uh, on the rocket side, we tried to match that configuration, but for example, we still, we did this very quickly, so we left in our non blocking data cache and we left in our um, atomic uh, operations, which are not really very useful for Drystone, but they were in there. Um, we didn't have time to take them out. So it's not quite an apples to apples comparison, but pretty close. Um, but overall, we're kind of faster, smaller, lower power than the ARM core. Um, and also, just to point out, Rocket's actually a 64 bit core, whereas A5 is a 32 bit core in this comparison, right? Um, so that's just one data point. You'll see a couple more data points to, tomorrow morning for very simple cores and for very complex cores. Um, yeah, so there'll be, be. So, one thing about these Berkeley cores, um, even if you don't use them, I think what's important about them is they show you that the ISA is competitive, right? Um, you know, a small team can build cores that compete with industry cores on the metrics we've seen. So, there's nothing, you know, deficient about this simple ISA is enough to run the benchmarks other people run at speed, right? So, and a very good implementation. So uh, I think that's one of the takeaways you should have from this, not just can I use that particular Berkeley core, um, but th this is some kind of validation of the whole ISA itself. Okay, so um, I'm sort of switch gears again now. That was the Berkeley open source course. You hear a lot more in the talks coming up. I talk about the state of the RISC V nation. Um, so a lot of momentum since the hot chips rolled out last year. Um, a lot of company, I've been talking to lots of companies. Uh, I've, many of you I've spoken with at your companies about this, and a lot of companies are kicking the tires um, with varying levels of interest, um, you know, more or less serious about uh, adopting RISC-V. Um, I'm, my own self-assessment of where you are right now, people, you know, the engineer at this company comes up and asks me, what should I do with RISC-V, okay? So I think if you were thinking of designing your own risc ISA for some project, just don't do that. That's just, you should just use RISC-V. It'll save you many, many, you know, staff years of work right now. Just take RISC V right now. If you were going to do your own, roll your own RISC V core, just a uh, risk core, just don't do that. That's just a, that's where we are. You should just use RISC V. I can quite confidently say that's where you should be. On the other hand, if you need a complete working supported core to put into a design today, you should go pay somebody a few million bucks for that, right? Because you're not going to get that today with a RISC V core, right? If you want something that's complete working and supported, you know, that you can call somebody up and blame them for your bug, right? You know, you have to pay lots of money for that, right? However, if you want a simple core, your deadline's more a few months away, um, you should think seriously whether the millions of dollars you'd spend to license that core would be better spent engineering your own simple core than reusing the environment we have here, right? So, you know, in terms of long-term ROI, um, I, I predict it's gonna be better for you to actually invest in making RISC-V work for you rather than keep paying uh, millions of dollars to these other entities for the, the licenses. Um, okay, so um, yeah, so I think over time this, this will change. I think in a year or so, the story may be very different. You may be able to find support for a complete core that's ready to go right now in Steiner Standard Flow. But as of today, I think this is kind of where we are. So there's a lot of concerns. I go talk to a lot of people about RISC V ecosystem. Um, you know, fragmentation, how do you stop an extensive ISA becoming a thousand different incompatible RISC V ISAs? Um, there's an issue with momentum, so you know, heavily Berkeley driven so far. What happens when we get bored and do another research project? Um, we kind of, we actually design in a kill switch to all of our projects, so we do switch over regularly. Um, completeness, you know, there's some feature that's not in the system right now. How's that going to happen? You know, FUD and attacks, you know, you'll hear other people say, well, there's going to be patent lawsuits. Anybody who tries to do this commercially is going to get sued out of the water. Um, and also, like, just support. Where do I get paid help? I'm prepared to pay for some support, but I don't know who's going to do this for me. Like, all the grad students here have done all this stuff, but they have PhDs to get. It's not really their job to uh, be, you know, uh, consultants for you guys. And they, they shouldn't be taking paid support contracts because they should be working on their PhDs. All right. All right. So kind of to address some of this, um, the thing we've been doing is creating a, a RISC V Foundation. Um, and the mission statement here is to standardize, protect, promote free and open RISC V 
ISA, and it's hardware and software ecosystem for use in all computing devices, right? So we're in the process of setting up a 501c6 um, foundation, um, and we recruited Rick O'Connor as the executive director, and Rick is sitting right over there. So the plan is Rick is going to take us through launch, and then, you know, if everybody who's in the foundation is happy, Rick, he'll keep going. But for <laughs> so he's, he's agreed to help us through the whole launch process, again, this foundation off the ground. Um, I'm in the process of currently recruiting the founding member companies. Um, so um, I've talked to a bunch of you individually about this, but uh, um, basically, you know, by the, the plan is actually to buy hot chips, do a public announcement of the foundation, and the initial founding members, people who've agreed to join the consortium. And then um, short time after that, you have to have your check in the bank to be a founding member versus just somebody who tags along later on, right? Um, so we're currently recruiting these founders. And the hope is you guys are interested in helping us to get this thing off the ground and get it, get it sustained. We have a bunch of companies already agreed to be part of this. And so we just want to build up that, um, you know, our roster of uh, founding members for the announcement. So please talk to me and Rick today about that. Uh, that's one of the things you should be doing at the, the workshop next couple of days. So the principles of the foundation, um, so these are you know, guiding principles. So the RISC-5 ISA and related standards should remain open and license free to all parties. So you can use it even if you're not a member, right? It should be open and license free to everybody. Um, the standard specs will be publicly available, anybody can get them. Compatibility suites, open source, available to anybody uh, from the website. Um, now to protect the standard, only members in good standing can use the RISC-5 trademark on their products. If you're doing a commercial product and when you label it as RISC-5, you have to be a member and you have to pass the compatibility tests. Um, if you're non-commercial, some open source project, just doing it for fun, you can use the trademark provided you pass the compatibility tests. You don't have to pay anybody anything, but if you're not making any money from it, it's fine to use a trademark if you pass the compatibility test, which will be open source. Uh, anybody can use. Um, so this is a lot of text, but basically the things we want the foundation to do, you know, manage information, um, run these workshops, so I don't have to, um, uh, responsible for sustaining, evolving the ISA and responding to the needs of the community. Basically, the membership should be driving this. Once this thing gets off the ground, the companies and the other organizations using this should be the people driving the agenda. Um, uh, one other thing we want to do to help with the, the FUD and patent uh, fears are to uh, we've already started this project, is maintain a directory of um, public domain um, architecture and microarchitecture techniques that are culled from expired patents and, you know, publications. So basically we can build up this sort of, you know, uh, you know stack of stuff that anybody who wants to litigate with five have to fight through. And, you know, we're pretty good at, we know a lot of old ISAs, a lot of old, there's a lot of old stuff there. Uh, I think we can put together um, uh, a pretty strong portfolio there. Um, We'll also sell T-shirts, yeah, to, to raise money. <laughs> so the organization um, is going to be a uh, seven-member board. Um, initially, we're going to handpick this from the founding members. Um, but the idea is that there'll then be a rolling, expiring term and you know, be re-elected by the membership once it gets going. Um, they're kind of responsible for making everything work. Um, and the idea is the way the actual stuff, the actual work. So one thing is the foundation is meant to be relatively lightweight. There's, we don't want a lot of money going to some of this foundation to do development work. It's really just overseeing other things. And the idea is the foundation is going to bless ad hoc committees to go off and study whatever. You know, the, uh, you know, the crypto extension, the whatever extension. You know, interested parties go off, form an ad hoc committee under the blessing of the, the board. The, re the reason to have the board bless it is so we don't have 100 different crypto extensions being worked on independently, right? So, you know, this is the official sanction group doing the extensions, whatever, um, and the board has the right to terminate the committee if they don't make any progress, right? So um, that's kind of just the, the purpose is to make things move forward. Um, and the other thing is part of this, we want to bake in a public uh, portion of anything so the committee can go off and do their work, but at some point it has to be open for everybody, not even foundation members, of, you know, globally visible, this is what we were thinking about doing, any comments? And those comments plus the committee stuff will come to the board to make the final decision, right? Um, so the membership levels, like I said, we're making this pretty lightweight. And so um, the sponsor members, um, I changed the name to Silver, Platinum, Gold, Silver, are basically the three levels of, we expect most commercial organizations to come in, um, sort of 50K, 25K, and 5K a year. Um, and you get one vote per organization um, in, in selecting the board. Um, auditing members, 25 k a year. This will be for universities and other organizations who are not interested in voting in this thing. They don't get a vote. Individual members, 100 bucks a year, no vote. Students, 50 bucks a year, no vote. Now, one of the reasons the individuals don't get votes is problems with other organizations of ballot stuffing. So 
you know, basically, and if, you're a, if your company's a member, you're a member. And you're a member of a company if your income is more than 50% derived from that company, right? So, so this is kind of just trying to keep things straight. So any organization only gets one vote, and they cannot vote for their own candidates. So you have to vote for somebody else's candidate. So we wanna, with enough companies, we think this will keep everybody fair and honest. Right? So, you know, we have this landscape's evolving. There's, you know, the, the foundation is supposed to oversee everything that's going on. Uh, we'll be, have the membership you know, play into that. Um, so there's open source, government public, there's nonprofit, there's commercial providers doing stuff, there's startups happening that I know of um, in this space as well. Um, okay, so our goal is to become the industry standard ISA for everything. Um, you know, that's the modest goal. Um, uh, okay, so that's what we're here to do. Um, so the workshop organization, let me uh, switch gears a little. Okay. I think that's it, and I'll just take some questions. Uh, just a logistics question. Maybe this will be answered in the talk on the supervisor mode, but uh, there was a draft that was circulated about, I think, a month or two months ago. Uh, can you just say something about the st status of that and the tool chain correspondence to that? Right, the supervisor spec, we put out a, proposal, a draft. There's been a few comments and changes that we made to that. Um, Andrew will give a talk later today about that. Um, and he should hopefully have the current status in his talk about where that actually is. Um, yeah, so I defer to his talk. Yeah. There's a question over here somewhere. Um, for the breakout sessions, will it be a chance to make suggestions for yeah, sessions. yeah, for sure. So I'll do a I'll do a, a list of things and ask for suggestions to fill out the, the set of tables. So we have space both here and up in the where the poster rooms are going to be to do different breakouts. So you know, space to spread out into different meeting groups. Um, is there going to be some kind of session or poster about Jackhammer? Um, this was going to be our, our last in the last workshop. There was some talk of you guys developing some tool that would generate chisel. Um, yeah, we have, well, Jackhammer is a project to do design space exploration in Chisel, but um, the, the relative, Adam is over here, <laughs> so he's the student who's been developing that, and Jonathan's over there, so I think they'd both be happy to talk to you about where Jackhammer is. Okay, well, I think we actually finished early, that's good. Um, I think we can just dive into the, the next talk, so, uh, all right, so that's it, and we'll switch over to uh, Alex.